First John 1, 8 to 10. And then chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Let's read together. First John 1, verse 8. Reading. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now two verses of chapter 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that he sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours solely, but also for the sins of the whole world. Our topic for today is Christian and his personal sins. Sin is Christian's biggest problem on this earth. Some people think it's lack of money that is the biggest problem. Some people think it's the sickness that they are troubled with that's the biggest problem. Some others think, well, it's the persecution that they face. But I do not think so. Yes, lack of money, sickness, persecution, all have its severity. Nobody denies it. Nonetheless, the greatest trouble that a Christian face is a sin. So at the very outset, I want to challenge you to consider this. Have you ever realized your sin has been the greatest trouble that you faced? Or you just passed over it? Oh, everybody got sin, so it should be okay. Since I'm doing well, those little sins are okay. Is it how you think? There is no greater danger than the sin that hides within us, which we cherish either secretly or sometimes openly. There are Christians who are very daring to openly admit that they have certain sins and yet leave it untouched, giving all sorts of problem, problems to the dear ones, to parents, to children, to spouses, to all those who are around. Now, as we learned yesterday, oh sorry, last Lord's Day, sin or walking in darkness is a hindrance to our Christian fellowship. It gravely damages not only our Christian joy and effectiveness, but also the sweetness of Christian fellowship. Wherever there is sin, it's going to affect relationship, Christian relationship. Let's say if you are a married couple and both are Christians, if sin creeps in, the sweetness that you enjoyed, the excitement with which you got married will all soon evaporate. It will become a very difficult relationship. And so it is in your business, in your workplaces, and even in the church. Sin destroys the sweetness of fellowship. So sin must be dealt with and we must be willing to mortify the sin within us. And the Bible has very clear warning and caution against sin that prevails. And it urges us to give up, mortify the sin in our bodies. Now here is Apostle Paul's urge, urging, Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. He exhorts us, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He says, mortify your members which are upon earth, 
If you are functioning in a carnal way, the Bible says it's time to kill it. No mercy, no sympathy, no second thought. Kill. <coughs> Mortify. You know, when God says, slain, you must slain. If you don't, it's going to displease the Lord. When King Saul was sent to Amalekites to destroy them, God said, destroy them all. <coughs> even their beasts, even their cattle. But King Saul brought back all the fat cattle and said it is for sacrifice. And the Lord said it is better to obey than to sacrifice. It is better to obey. Some of you would say, oh, I just want to prove that God is gracious. So let my sin be there so it will make God look more gracious. No, don't do it. You may, in the, you may be walking in the same peril as King Saul walked. <coughs> Hebrews 12, verse 1. A similar exhortation is given to us. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So we are commanded there to lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Some Christians have this attitude saying, oh look, the Bible says there are such a thing called besetting sin. Pastor, this is my besetting sin. It's not easy to be put aside. But when the Bible talks about besetting sin, it is not talking to you that you may have the permission to continue with it. When the Bible talks about the besetting sin, it is to encourage you to drop it, to lay it aside, not to cherish it. So the scripture is clear. We cannot live with our sin. We've got to do something about it. And that is to lay aside or even to kill Unfortunately, as John tells us in verses 8 and 10, a lot of people in the church conjecture that there is no sin in them. They assume that there is no sin. They are all right. And that is very dangerous, isn't it? Let's look at verses 8 and 10 at this time. Verses 8 and 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You see at the beginning of verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, that's the conjecture some people have, that there is no sin. And that again he repeats in verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, and some say we don't even sin that much. Or we don't sin at all. There is a group of Christians who believe in sinless perfection. The moment you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have no sin. But the scripture is clear that's not the case. Now let's consider this. It's a dreadful thing to deny the presence of sin. Or even the propensity that we have towards sin. Don't we have, even though we are Christians, terrible attraction towards sin? I often say this about myself. If I'm very frank, I must say that I am more keen to sin than to do that which is righteous. My, right, my natural passion is always to look at that which is evil, to think about that which is carnal, to desire that which is materialistic. It takes really God's mercy and grace to discipline me, to keep me thinking the holy things of God. And it's a dreadful thing. But you see, that dreadful awareness of our sin cannot be dealt with if you just cover it up. It leads you even worse scenario. 
denying the presence of sin which we secretly cherish within or commit habitually is to be untruthful before God. And I must say, imagination of sinlessness is an inward lie. Imagination of sinlessness is an inward sinfulness. If there is one thing that sin would teach you, is not to acknowledge it as a sin. That's what we call the sinfulness of sin. Or the deceitfulness of sin. Can anyone in this congregation say, I have no sin? One may say that I have no sin with reference to his standing in Christ Jesus as a forgiven sinner. Now we all understand that. That's the theological truth. The Lord has forgiven all my sins so that I stand before him as a righteous person in Christ Jesus. But practically speaking, who is without sin or without a propensity towards sin? None. Now, many of you may resent anyone calling you a sinner. Nonetheless, before God, are we not unclean because of the sins of our heart and body? Are we not unclean? Let's say you stand before a man right now and he says, you have, you have sin. You are a sinner. And you get angry with him. And then the next moment you stand before God and God says, you sinner. Well, I don't think you will be very angry. You cannot be. Robert McShane, the famous Scottish preacher, who died at a very young age of 40, said this, Amazing statement with regard to the sinfulness of sin within us. He said, the seeds of all my sins are in my heart. And perhaps the more dangerous that I do not see them. You know, you have to admit this right here, right now. We do have a problem. Each of us, every one of us, all of us, collectively and individually, got a problem. You know what's that? We have great difficulty in recognizing our own sin. We can easily say, oh, I'm a sinner. But what's your sin? Well, I'm not so sure. Let me check. We have a problem with this. And Robert McShane said it so eloquently. The seeds of all my sins are in my heart and perhaps the more dangerous that I do not see them. To have sin unrecognized in our heart is to bear the consequences of those sins sooner or later. It will not be a dead seed in your heart. It will produce its evil fruits in a matter of time. Whether it be jealousy or anger or lustfulness or greed, it will soon bring up its real color. Another Puritan writer, C. Stanford, has written about our sinfulness in this way. Please listen to this. I quote, Motives that seem to you as white as the light may prove when seen through his prism to be many colored. Aims that seem straight as a line may when tested by the right standard prove indirect and tortuous. We shall find at last that in many cases what we have thought devotion was indevolved. What we have thought love 
was struck through with the taint of selfishness. What we have thought faith was utterly vitiated with the poison of unbelief. How true it is. What we thought is our great devotion may be full of indevotion. Can be a devotion to ourselves and our glory than a devotion to God's glory. We can do things which means all for personal glory and nothing for God. And that we think we have done a great service to God. We may think that we are loving someone, but our love may be based on some selfish gain and pleasure. Yes, my dear friend, this is true. We cannot afford to deny the existence of sin in us. Now let me go further. The scripture in verses 8 and 10 talks about the consequences of conjecturing sinlessness. You know, there is great consequences that you and I must be aware of that will result from assuming that we have no sin. First, we deceive ourselves. And that's the problem of conjecturing sinlessness in our heart. Verse 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Please understand the gravity of that statement. We deceive ourselves. Let me ask you, can an enlightened, sane mind say that he has no sin? I repeat, I hope you capture the gravity of the thing that I'm trying to bring across. Can an enlightened and sane mind say that he has no sin? And yet many of us walk as though we have no sin to deal with. And we spend our days and nights without confessing sins. Are we not deceiving ourselves? You know how dangerous it is to be fooled? I was reading some reports about what's going on in the United States with regard to this election campaigns for the presidency. Now, of course, they are still fighting within the parties and one of the most uh, uh, popular fight is the one between uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. And, you know, re recently many of you noticed Hillary is very upset about the verbaso of uh, Obama. And she's attacking him. And the latest uh, thing that was going on brought out very interesting statements from both camps. Hillary said, you can make me a fool, but the worst is I made fool twice. You know what she's saying? If you fool me once, I understand. But if you fool me twice, I'm the real fool. Because I love you to fool me a second time. Now, how terrible it is with us. How many times are we fooled by sins and at walk about without confessing sins? Are we not terrible fools? Not twice, not thrice, not ten times, not hundred times have we been fooled to think we have nothing much to repent, isn't it? We deceive ourselves. Where will it end? A young man who start lusting after a girl because of certain terrible movies you watched would probably end up raping a girl sooner or later and live in the fear of it. A young girl who start reading all kinds of filthy novels may end up sleeping with a boy before marriage, committing fornication, and she has to live the rest of her life with that problem. It all starts with a simple deception of reading something bad or looking at something bad and saying to yourself, that's okay, and then dwell on the, on the things that you read or watched and finally end up doing it, deceiving yourself utterly. 
So does a man who begins a business endeavor. Because he is made greedy by some people around him. And say, hey, let's put together our money. Let's go. And then when everything is taken away, he kicks himself and says, what a fool I am. I should have been more careful. But it's too late. The scripture warns us, the greatest danger is not just these consequences that can be repaired here or there, but the worst is that we deceive ourselves saying that we are righteous without repenting from our sin and walk all the way only to find out we are left behind for eternal fire. So remember, the consequence of conjecturing sinlessness is deceiving ourselves. Let not this deception be an utter deception in our souls. The second consequence of assuming that there is no sin within us, according to verse 8, is this. We become untruthful persons. Because he says, and the truth is not in us. The truth is not in us. You see, dear friends, denying our sins is to deny indisputable facts. What is the indisputable fact? We are sinners. We have sin. And if we dare say I have no sin. That is denying. That which is indisputable. Oh how untruthful we are. Are we not untruthful. When we do not repent. When we live as though there is nothing to repent. When there is. Such self-pride and self-glorying and self-convictions. It's so terrible. How untruthful you are. How un untruthful I become when I have no time to look into myself, to see my sins. Look at the third consequence of assuming that we are sinless. We make God a liar. Verse 10 says that. Take verse 10 together with verse 8 and see this. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Whoa! Make even God a liar? That's asking for trouble, isn't it? To deny our sinful disposition is to refute the propriety of God's scheme of redemption. You see, why did God plan for our redemption? Why did he make the atonement of his blood a perpetual thing for us? Why did he make us or make for us a part of salvation? Why did he make all those promises? Because he knows we are sinners. It is for sinners that Jesus Christ came. If there is no sinner, no savior is needed. So let us not make our God a liar by our self-justification. <coughs> Even today we need him. We are sinners if God's forgiveness is not received. Oh, let's not make God a liar. That's a serious thing to do. <clears throat> the, the other consequence of denying the presence of sin is found at the end of verse 10. And that is that we are unbiblical men. Look at the end of verse 10. And his word is not in us. His word is not in us. If you do not confess that you have sins, <coughs> the Bible says God's word is not in us. In other words, those who deny the existence of sin within them are rejecting the infallible testimony of God's word that we have sins. You stand in opposition to the infallibility of God's word that declares the truth that we are sinners. 
You know how terrible it is to be an unbiblical Christian? Look, you and I who have failed to constantly acknowledge our sinfulness before God. Look again, my dear friend. You and I who have taken it a small matter to, to cleanse ourselves by coming before God with confession of sin are in danger of all these things that we just noticed. We deceive ourselves. We become untruthful persons. We make God a liar. And we are really unbiblical men. Now we move on to the next major truth that John teaches us today. That's in verse 9. Confession of sins. <coughs> Confession of sins. Let's look at verse 9. <coughs> if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is not a deliberate hypocrisy that we are encouraged to practice, but confession of our sins. The Bible doesn't give us any room to think that we can go to church and get involved in all kinds of activities and then go home without confession of sins. <clears throat> Open not your mouth in song because you think you are outright righteous. Do not stretch out your hands with money in it and think that, oh, God is going to take it because after that I can feel good I've given you know, dear friends, one of the greatest problems, I must say, is that we go, often go away from the church like a man who paid his income tax and feel very good about it. I owe the government nothing. You know, we, we sometimes say, agree, okay, I got some sins. I got no time to think about all these. I often make these mistakes. It's part of me. It's me. You either like it or you hate it. That's what you get when you deal with me. I'm a sinner. Okay? No problem. But look, I'm going to church. I'm going to worship God every Lord's Day. And that's a new resolution in 2008. And I'm going to do it. And I've been doing it for two months now. And I'm pretty good in it. I'm early. I'm earlier than some of our elders and pastors. And I'm doing it well. And I'm not rushing out. I'm, you know, trying to keep that good spirit of fellowship in the church, I'm contributing. And recently I've been giving my tithes regularly. Oh look, I owe God a lot of things and these are things I owe, my sins. And look at here, I'm doing some good things, isn't it? Look at them, I'm going to church, I'm staying there a lot more than before, I'm giving my tithes and more than that. <clears throat> that makes me happy. Here I go singing. Sweeter as the years go by. Stop there, God says. What? Are you preaching a religion of righteousness of your own? Some of us are Roman Catholics by practice. Don't get angry with me, okay? We can preach, oh, justification is by faith, by grace. And let go away thinking that our righteous, our sins are taken care of because we give something really noticeable to God. And they are not insignificant. You know, I gave $10,000. Or I gave really good service today. I sang beautifully today. Or I helped to move the Holy Communion table. That's even better. Stop this give and take attitude when it comes to forgiveness of sin. It just won't work. What shall we do? The Bible says, confess your sins. God cannot be fooled. God does not preach a hypocritical religion toward us. He requires us to confess our sins 
He tells me to repent from my sins. Let everyone say this. It is my sin that the Lord wants me to forgive. From that phrase, if we confess our sins, may, may I suggest two things? Firstly, acknowledge before God that you are a sinner. Acknowledge it. Even now, right now. Tell it to God. Lord, I am a sinner. A terrible sinner indeed. Can you say this truly from your heart? That's what God wants to hear. God doesn't want you to sit here, see you sitting here so contented, self-appreciating saint of God. Oh, wow. God must be happy I'm here, you know. I'm sitting in front, or I'm sitting in the middle, or I'm at the back, but in a way pastor can see, so it's okay. God must be happy. No, don't say any of these things. Just, you know, these are all disgusting to God. If we are counting on any merit of our own, forget about it. You're doomed. You're deceiving yourself. Let's acknowledge sincerely. Let all the sins of your heart come now straight up to your brain. Let it fill your mind. See yourself as you are. Oh, my sins, they're terrible. My thoughts, my lust, my cravings, my bitterness, my intolerance, my impatience, my unforgiveness. Lord, if you don't have that spirit, you will be like the Pharisee who said, seeing the publican next to him, Lord, I'm not like many others. I'm not like this publican. I thank thee. But if you are like a real publican who realized his sins and acknowledges a publican, he said, Lord, have mercy. I'm a sinner. Because he cannot bear the burden of his sin in his own heart. He beats his chest and cry out to the Lord. Acknowledge your personal sins. And then I must say this. Lay bare before him your situation with all its shame. You know, in public, public confessions, people cannot often say the details of your sin, how it occurred, why it occurred, and all the complexity and nastiness and mischief of your sin. That's why I can never understand I can never understand the Roman Catholic pra practice of confession box. People going to a priest and telling, how much can they tell? How much will they tell? Cannot. These people are not worthy to listen. And they are not trustworthy to tell them all these things. You know, one of the things I often say in my counseling time, you know, please... If possible, don't tell me everything. There's no need. All that you need to do is to confess before God. You think it's, it's easy to listen to people's sins? Oh, it's terrible. I don't want anyone to know my sins. Why should I hear other people's sins? Unless they really need help in some area, how to overcome it, then I may listen to that. But I do not want to hear anyone's sins. But again, isn't it true? Somebody has to hear to help us how to overcome our sins. Sometimes somebody has to listen to us, to tell us, you know, this is wrong. You've got to get over it. Or to say, oh, you are forgiven. Go to God. Tell him. Lord, I'm embarrassed to say this. But look what I'm doing. I hate this. How shameful, how terrible. If we confess our sins, lay bare before him your situation with all its shame. Now, John tells us the reasons why we should confess our sins to God. Why should we confess to God all our sins? 
Firstly, he says the goodness of God welcomes us to him to tell him all our sins. And he says he is faithful and just. He is faithful and just. How wonderful is that promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive all our sins. When we deny our pretension of no sin, he deals with us faithfully and is just to fulfill his promise toward every repenting person that he will forgive us. Our Lord is a just God. He is a faithful God. He is faithful to keep his promise of forgiveness. He is a just God and therefore he will not leave you stranded. Because he is holy and faithful he will come to fulfill that which he has promised. To every repenting person the Lord is good. Secondly, the Bible tells us the reason why we should confess our sin is because of the promise of pardon and purification. There's great promise of pardon and purification. Second half of verse 9 says to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ah, oh, what a relief! What a relief! My sins are forgiven. And I'm cleansed as though I never had any sins. You know, dear friends, the promise of forgiveness is so free, so unreserved, so full that it purges our heart of all guile and all embarrassment before him. In a word of all unrighteousness. You know, the word all unrighteousness it encompasses the severity of sin the shamefulness of sin and all the difficult thing that accompanies that sin the Lord takes them all out he promises he cleanses us thoroughly What great relief. What great relief. You know, one of the things I must clarify here is that it does not mean he will take away the consequences of sin. Some people read this and think that, oh, I have confessed my sin and God is going to take away the unrighteousness of it and that would mean I will not have any consequence. You know, if a young boy and a girl comes together in fornication and they are afraid that the girl is going to be pregnant and they go to God and say sorry I will never do it again let not that girl be you know not pregnant it's not going to happen the consequences of sin would have to come but how are you going to bear it abortion and some people go for quick ways you have to face it but God will be gracious to you. You'll be just and faithful how to handle it. It's a tough thing, I know. But I have to tell the truth. The Bible never says the consequences of sin will be lifted from you. That's why we cannot entertain sin. There are serious consequences that will come. But thank God that he is reminding us before things get ugly that let's stop our sins confess them right away to pretend there is no sin is to deceive you but to acknowledge your sin and lay bare them with all its shamefulness now is to be redeemed is to be forgiven and also it will help you to prevent the nasty consequences of sin that is to come but you've got to do it now not later. Start doing it right now. But I want to share with you <clears throat> some interesting things that uh, I have come across in my meditation of God's Word. And I want to talk about <clears throat> how sometimes 
we are deceived by ourselves and the sins within us concerning the sin within how we get deceived by the sin within us to pretend to be holy and deny the existence of sin within us firstly we try to balance off our sins by some pseudo virtues okay this is one of the ways this may be out of my sermon outline but take note of this some of the things that we do to cover our sins and which are deceptive I repeat the first one we balance off our sins with some pseudo virtues you know this is what I tried to explain a while ago we do a kind of bookkeeping a debtor creditor account with God on one side we acknowledge of God, okay, these are my weaknesses. On the other side, we write down so-called meritorious work we do and pass it off as balanced check signed. Stop this nonsense. It's dangerous. We are getting into greater sin by doing so. Second thing that many of us do in order to cover our sin and deceiving ourselves is by assuming virtues that are not our own as ours by assuming virtues that are not our own as our own now, what do I mean by this? There are people who take great pride in attending a good church. Oh, I'm in a reform fundamental church. And my pastor is a well-known pastor. He is known to be a preacher of, uh, of the highest standard. I'm a member. Okay, let's say Gatsumina BP Church, which is nothing like what I said. But nonetheless, you are very proud of Gatsumina BP Church. Oh, I'm from Gethsemane BP Church. And I've just attended. And you commit some sins. And you're troubled about it, but you come out and somebody says, Oh, what church are you from? Oh, I'm from Gethsemane BP Church. You know about our pastor? He never means words. He attack. He attack. But I still attend. I like the way he preach, you know? Hmm. You put on somebody else's virtue. Your church's virtue on yourself. And pretend that you have no sin. Or you may say, oh, I'm from a Christian home. My parents are Christians. They do pray for me every day. We have family prayer meeting every day. We do worship God. My surname, Koshi, you know. My grandfather was a preacher. My father is a bishop. I am a pastor. And my son can say, oh, I got a long line of spiritual scars <laughs> useless well there is a third deception he takes the virtue that is not his and rejoice in them So that the wises in him may not bring bitterness to him. I repeat. He takes virtues that do not belong to him. And rejoice in it. So that the wisest within him may not embitter him. What do they do? This is a very cunning thing. It's a very cunning thing. You know, you look around. And you say, oh, pastor, I must tell this to pastor. Pastor, I was talking to so-and-so. You know what I found out? 
this guy is having an affair. Wow. So suddenly he comes around as a detective. And he reports to pastor and say, I found out something wrong with so and so. He never says that he is watching pornography day and night. He doesn't say the kind of vulgarity that he utters with his friends. Ah, uh, God knows that. That is okay. So he comes out a righteous man by putting on the garb of righteousness which doesn't belong to him. He's trying to, to be very righteous by pinpointing somebody's, somebody else in. So what is the robe he's wearing now? One of a spiritual mentor. One of a righteous man. One of a spiritual counselor. When he shouldn't have taken it. And some of us are good at it. A spendthrift preacher can deliver a homily on the vices of a miser. But it never occurs to him that it is a wise thing that he is doing when he doesn't give his tithes. There are pastors who say, you must give your tithe, and he never gives his own. Now that's the problem I just mentioned. A fourth deception we have is that we disguise our vices. We disguise our vices. You know what's that? We give them false names. We dress them up as virtues and call them such. And really, we think they are virtues. Seducing and being seduced. Deceived and being deceived. A young man steals from his father's pocket and he goes out and spends the money with some of his ill-disciplined friends and he says, I'm a good man because I help my poor friend in the school who doesn't have enough money to play the video game. And he feels great about it because they all say, thank you, thank you, my friend, thank you, my friend. And he shakes his head and says, don't worry, you know. Any time. What do you mean by any time? Any time I steal? And there are people like this. Who dress up their vices and call it virtue. There's another form of deception when we deal with our sin. You know what's that? We change the form and style of doing a sin. And then we think we are done with it. We don't really confess and put it aside. We sort of redirect it. Change the shape of it. Change the way we do it. Last time we were open about it. Now I'm not so open about it. Last time I used to sing all those secular songs. Now occasionally I listen in my car, that's all. Last time I would go to cinema theater and watch all the wicked shows. Oh, now I don't do it, but you know, once in a while some dirty films on my computer. We try to reduce the, the, the frequency of certain sins and the shape of it. And the length of it. And then we think that we have done with it. No. That's deception. Let's ask. What are we doing? When we cannot disguise anymore, this is the next and the last that I want to share with you today. 
when we can no longer disguise our sins, we hide behind all manner of excuse. Like King Saul said, Oh, I brought all this back because I wanted to offer to the Lord. So Samuel said, It's better to obey than to sacrifice. We find fantastic excuses. You know, I see this so often in my life, in my family life, in my children's life. Sometimes my children would say, Daddy, do you know what he did? He did this. Really? Bring him here. Ask him to come and see him. After a while, the other one says, Daddy, you know what that she is doing or he is doing? So what is he? The same thing that he accused of me. Okay, bring her here. Go bring him here. Ah, so why do it? Because he did a while ago, so I thought I'm okay. Now this is what I always say. Do not justify your sin by the sin of somebody else. Oh, he provoked me, so I slap him. He slapped me, so I stabbed him. He stabbed me, so I killed him. Excuses. excuses because no more covering no more disguising of it the Bible says if we sin and if we do not confess we deceive ourselves there is no truth in us we make God a lie how dangerous so dear friends let's confess our sins as chapter 2 tells us, you know, let's not forget that. The goodness and promises of God is willing to forgive every humble and readily repenting sinner. This is what we read. We will talk about this passage next week at length, God willing. My little children, these things write I unto you, that is sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours solely, but also for the sins of the whole world. What a wonderful Savior is our God. He has given us his Son to be our perpetual mediator before God, that all our sins may be forgiven. Let us not hide our sins, but come with all its shame to our faithful and just God who promised to forgive us. You are not the only one who needs to do it. I'm not the only one who has to repent. All the great men of God in the past has admitted uh, and repented readily. So let our hearts also repent from our sins. Here is an example in conclusion, David, after committing his great sin of adultery with Bathsheba, cried out in Psalm 51, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. My sin is ever before me. Is your sin before you? Do you see them? Or are you hiding it? It's dangerous. And let's learn lessons from God's word and from the life of godly men. And learn to rely on God's goodness for the forgiveness of sin. Paul, the great apostle, said in 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He didn't say, I was chief. I was a chief sinner before I became a Christian. He didn't say, I was a chief sinner before I became an apostle. He says, as he write this letter, as an apostle. 
that I am chief. Among who? Among sinners who need a savior. You and I equally need our savior. Right now, right here. For our sins are before us and before God. Do you see them? Or do you try to hide them? Let's do not deceive ourselves anymore. Let's go to God and ask him to be merciful, to forgive us. Humble ourselves. Let's pray.